Welcome to Grand Rounds. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, today's speakers, Dr. Nagla Wilson and uh, Dr. Albert Tu. Dr. Wilson is uh, a staff pediatric radiologist uh, and assistant professor of uh, radiology in the uh, Department of Medical Imaging uh, at the University of Ottawa. And she's been on our faculty since 2018. Uh, she completed her training in radiology in, uh, in Egypt, and uh, as well as a master's and PhD degrees in radiology, also in Egypt. And then she undertook a two-year fellowship in pediatric radiology here at uh, CHEO. She joined the faculty at McGill at the Montreal Children's Hospital and was there for six years before we were fortunate to recruit her here to, uh, to CHEO and the University of Ottawa. She has an eclectic uh, area of interest in neuroradiology and uh, uh, to, with a particular interest in theory one malformations, uh, the subject of today's rounds. Dr. Albert Tu uh, is a pediatric neurosurgeon at CHEO. I'm an assistant professor uh, in the Department of Surgery at the University of Ottawa. Uh, he was recruited to join our faculty in 2019. He completed his training in neurosurgery at UBC and then a fellowship in pediatric neurosurgery at uh, Children's Hospital of uh, LA. Um, he uh, was in practice uh, in Minnesota for a number of years with a particular focus on uh, uh, tone management and uh, <clears throat> led a, a particular focus in that area there and, uh, and brought that uh, to his practice here uh, at uh, CHEO. Uh, he has, uh, again, an eclectic uh, array of interests uh, from a neuro uh, surgical perspective uh, and uh, significant interest in education and research. Uh, today, they are both going to address uh, uh, the issue of Chiari 1 malformations, uh, an approach to a common pediatric dilemma. And I believe that uh, Nagra, or is it Albert who's going to lead us off? Uh, uh, I'm going to start. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Duffy, for this kind introduction. Uh, and uh, we are today going to uh, speak about Chiari 1 malformations. Um, uh, we have no disclosures. Uh, our objectives today is to describe the radiological appearance and criteria for the diagnosis. We are going to describe the variations in the current management of patients with Chiari 1 malformation. And we will try to describe an approach to these patients integrating both radiologic and clinical data. Uh, Chiari 1 malformation is a common congenital malformation, and we often detect it incidentally. When we are doing an uh, MRI, we de de detect it incidentally. And in most cases, they are totally asymptomatic. But in patients who are clinically symptomatic or radiographically positive, surgical intervention may be offered. But what defines symptomatic or radiologically positive? Till now, there is no universally accepted clinical or radiologic criteria for selecting patients with Chiari 1 malformation for surgical versus non-surgical treatment. Uh, the currently used radiological features for Chiari 1 malformation in children, traditionally, it is the caudal descent of the cerebellar tonsils relative to the foramen magnum for 5 millimeter or mole. When we describe the tonsils, we mentioned that they are uh, pointed rather than rounded. Uh, there is crowding at the, the, of the medulla by the tonsils. When we do the CSF flow study, we see that there is a, a restricted flow surrounding the cervical medullary junction. And when we scan the spine, we are looking for a syrinx. We would like as well to assess the features of intracranial hypertension to ensure that this uh, tonsillar ectopia is not secondary to raised intracranial pressure. And let's see here on imaging what we are seeing. This is a sagittal T2-weighted sequence of the brain, and it is showing here the cerebellar tonsillar descent below the craniocervical junction. And as we can see on this axial view that there is crowding of the medulla by the herniated tonsil. And when we do a CSF flow study, we see the restricted flow around the, the craniocervical junction. Sometimes when we do the scanning of the spine, we either see a normal spine or we see that uh, there is a syrinx. And in this condition, there is a, a huge syrinx. We appreciate it on the sagittal T2 as well as uh, on uh, the axial T2. Albert. Thank you for that, Nagla. Um, when we talk about uh, why we think uh, Chiari malformations happen, just to take a step back, a Chiari 1 malformation radiographically does not mean that they're all the same. 
Um, what that refers to is the fact that the diagnostic criteria for a KRI1 malformation, that is you get some cerebellar tonsils which herniate out of their normal space, can actually occur secondary to a number of different processes. And each of these processes actually needs to be managed differently. Uh, as Dr. Wilson alluded to, you can get cases of hydrocephalus or increased intracranial pressure, which actually cause downward herniation of the tonsils forced into that space. Uh, you can get certain skull abnormalities or changes in the cranium itself. You can have even brain tumors or mass lesions, which cause displacement to the cerebellum into its uh, easiest to move to space, which is often the space around the spinal cord. However, for the purposes of this talk, and for most of the patients that we see, and we're talking about QR1 malformations, this is by and far an idiopathic condition, which we think is secondary to underdevelopment of the posterior fossa, specifically occipital bone. And this is probably something developmental that occurs at a very early stage in embryologic development, probably some sort of mesenchymal inadequacy. Uh, sorry. Uh, looking at these pictures here, the picture uh, with the green arrows is a picture of a patient who does not meet criteria for a PR1 malformation. And the picture with the red arrow is the patient who does meet criteria. Um, what this picture is trying to show that is essentially, if you look at the space between the two arrow points on each of these pictures, the picture with the green arrows shows what we expect to see in terms of space in the posterior fossa, that is space for the cerebellum. In comparison, what you can see with the picture with the red arrows is that there's much less space between the two arrowheads, basically implying that the posterior fossa, the occipital bone, is actually much smaller. If the brain is going to grow to a certain size, because that's what its growth trajectory is going to be, even if it's got a smaller space, it's going to try to find whatever space it can to reach that sort of minimum volume. And in most cases, it will, it will herniate or spread into other spaces, causing what we see radiographically, which is a QRM malformation. When we talk about clinical sym clinically symptomatic patients, if we survey the entire population and from previous studies, what we know is that by far most patients who actually do have issues related to, these, to this abnormality will have headache. And it's a very specific kind of headache. Most of these patients will have headaches that are occipital or in the posterior aspect of their, back, of their head. Some of them, about half of them, will have some degree of motor and sensory dysfunction. And this is pretty vague sometimes, um, but it's not normal. And about a third of these patients will have some degree of brainstem or cranial neuropathy. That is the patients who we think are symptomatic, not the patients overall. Um, when we look at the overall patient population, even in patients who are asymptomatic, about half of these patients will actually have a syrinx. But only a small number of patients with even a syrinx will actually be symptomatic from this fluid collection in their spine. So what's actually happening? Why do people actually get symptomatic from a QRM malformation? And the current dogma, the current belief is that it's secondary to some sort of transient obstruction of cerebral spinal fluid flow. Um, in these two pictures that we see here, the picture on the left is what we expect to see in patients who, have QR, who don't have a QR1 malformation. Uh, cerebral spinal fluid is constantly being made and as it tries to egress, it's gonna to try to exit through the uh, region of the posterior fossa. And the dotted blue arrow basically shows the pathway where it tries to leave the brain, exit into the posterior fossa, exit into the spinal canal and then circulate around. When you have a QR1 malformation, at least radiographically what you see is obstruction of the CSF flow. And we can see that on fluid flow studies, the fluid just doesn't egress the brain like it should. However, even in patients where radiographically we see what we think to be a complete obstruction of CSF flow out of that aspect of the brain, um, it doesn't seem to correlate very well or often at all um, with the actual development of clinical symptoms. And some of these patients may stay stable for a long time and never require any sort of intervention. Thank you, Albert, for that. 
So uh, now we can see that we have some radio uh, radiographic criteria and clinical criteria, and we don't know which one of them really per predicts the need for uh, surgical management. So let's review some of these cases to understand this dilemma. And we are going to start with this patient. She's a 12-month-old female. She's X31 weaker, and she was imaged because of a right parietal skull fracture. And when we have done the imaging here, we can see this is the sagittal T1 weighted sequence and the sagittal T2 weighted sequence. And again, we are seeing herniation of the tonsils in the upper cervical core, and it is posterior to the medulla with crowding at the level of the craniocervical junction. And when we have done the MRI, this is the sagittal T2 and multiple axial, we only see light prominence of the central canal, when, which is not enough to call it as a, a syrinx. And this uh, initial imaging was performed in 2016. When we have done a follow-up imaging for this kid at 2020, we again see here on the sagittal T2 weighted sequence that there is still a herniation of uh, the tonsils in the upper cervical spine below the McRae's line. And the, the CSF flow study is again showing restriction of the flow across uh, the craniocervical junction. But what we have seen previously as prominence of the central canal has completely resolved and the spine is completely normal. So what about the clinical for this patient, Albert? You know, in this case, if we look at this case sort of uh, in review, you know, we see that this is a QR1 malformation that was found incidentally for workup for a totally non-related issue. And this is actually probably the most common referral uh, pattern to my, at least to my practice, and I think to many people's practice. And what we can see over time is that just following this patient clinically, they've never developed any symptoms or remained well, reached their milestones with any, without ever having any complaints or symptoms of headaches, or any other typical symptoms we expect to see with the Chiara 1 malformation. So this was our first clinical scenario. Our second scenario is another patient. She's a 14-year-old girl. She was referred for evaluation of long-standing paresthesias in her upper extremities and lower extremities after swimming. We have again done the MR for this patient. And uh, this is the sagittal T1 weighted sequence. And we are again seeing the same finding. This patient is having herniation of her tonsils in her upper spine. There is <clears throat> a restriction, a significant restriction of flow at the craniocervical junction. But this patient, when we have imaged her spine, we found that she is having a scoliotic deformity to the right side in the upper cervical, uh, in the upper thoracic cord. But there was no syrinx in this patient, maybe minimal uh, prominence of uh, the central canal. So she is again having Chiari 1 malformation, but what is new is that she is having uh, scoliotic deformity and there is no syrinx in this patient. So clinically, it's interesting because even though the pictures are can be very, very similar, you know, when we actually talked to this patient and we actually went back in her history, she actually was, would come, excuse me, she actually had a very strong history of headaches that were associated with any sort of heavy exertion. And talking to the mother, you know, the mother thinks that, you know, her balance and coordination would get worse over time. When we actually talked to the patient themselves, um, we found that, you know, her symptoms of paresthesias had also been progressive over time as well. Um, you know, she, you know, in, excuse me, in my mind, had met criteria for having a symptomatic KR1 malformation. And we actually proceeded with the craniocervical decompression with the duroplasty, uh, which we'll talk about in a little more detail later on in the talk. And after surgery, uh, once she had uh, gone through the typical period of recovery, she's able to go back to swimming without any sort of uh, recurrence of her previous symptoms. Her headaches and her paresthesias is actually completely resolved. So now we'll move on to patient three. He's a nine-year-old male, and he has a juvenile onset scoliosis with asymmetric abdominal reflexes. So they just sent him for screening to see for any neural access abnormality. And again, when we have done the uh, MRI, this is the sagittal T1 post GADU, and the, this is the T2, sagittal T2 weighted sequence. And we can appreciate that there is herniation of the tonsils, again, below the craniocervical junction. And there is restriction of the flow. There is crowding the, uh, of uh, the medulla at the level of the craniocervical junction. And this patient readily has this uh, scoliotic deformity to the right side. He's a male, and he is nine years old. He is young. 
But when we have examined his spine, we can appreciate the presence of a large syrinx in his lower cervical and the upper thoracic region as appreciated on the sagittal T2 and on the axial T2 weighted sequence. So the difference here is that this patient has developed a syrinx in his spine. Um, when we talked to this patient also in retrospect, um, the patient actually also did have headaches associated with play activity as well. Um, and in talking to the mother as well as to the patient, they had actually actively reduced the amount of play that they've been engaging in just to avoid the headache type symptoms. Um, this patient, I feel just radiographically as well as from clinically, warranted some sort of further intervention. And similar to the last patient, also underwent a craniocervical decompression with the duroplasty. Since then, the patients actually had complete resolution of their headache and has returned to play. Um, the degree of their scoliotic deformity hasn't uh, changed on, uh, on subsequent follow-up, but I think further follow-up for this patient definitely is needed. In this case, when we talk about a symptomatic ER1 malformation, one of the things that we, I think we take away from this, that I took away from this case, and, and I think that many, uh, many other providers will also note as well, is that when you talk to the parents and their families, um, often the first thing or one of the subtle things they'll describe is that the kids are maybe playing less or less engaged in activities as before. Um, in younger children who can't espouse symptoms of a headache, they can't, they're not going to tell you what paresthesias are. Uh, one of the first things they may notice is they just must be less interested in playing or doing the normal activities that they would have before. Any sort of heavy exertion, they may back off on their own. Uh, a general rule that, uh, that, many, uh, that, my, that I myself follow, and I think many people do, is that a male patient, uh, which is already a little bit uh, atypical for idiopathic scoliosis, uh, but a male patient with a left convex scoliosis specifically really needs to be worked up for a potential neurogenic cause of their curvature, be it a clear artery malformation or some other neurologic cause. This is just an unusual population with an unusual curve. And when you have these sort of rare things happening, really needs to be worked up for a primary driver for the cause of their curvature. And as illustrated by this case, any patient with a scoliotic deformity and an abnormal neurologic exam should be evaluated for a potential neurologic cause. Um, when we look at these cases, and we try to talk about the possible interventions for a symptomatic ER1 malformation, there's really two ways we can approach these kinds of patients. Um, conservative management, you know, for very appropriate for patients who for example, might only have intermittent headaches or occasional headaches associated with some triggering factors like activity. Uh, easiest thing to do is avoid the symptom triggers or provide some pharmacologic ma management. Um, this is a reasonable approach for patients who aren't willing to undergo the risk of surgery or whose symptoms are so mild they're, that they're not at all debilitating. You know, a patient who only gets an occasional headache when they run a half marathon and who is not at all interested in running a half marathon may may elect to go this route of, uh, of management, and I think this is totally reasonable. Um, even if you do elect for a conservative approach, I think it's important to monitor these patients over time because their symptoms, as well as their radiographic findings, can progress, and it's important to catch them before they get uh, beyond, the, beyond the point of intervention. In patients who do undergo to, uh, excuse me, who do elect to undergo a surgical intervention, the standard intervention is what we call a cranial cervical decompression. Um, what this refers to is the fact that we actually remove the compressive components on that part of their brain. Um, specifically, this involves removal of the lower aspect of the occipital bone, uh, usually just the lip of the occiput. Um, often we'll take off the arch of the uh, first cervical, uh, uh, the cervical lamina of C1. And in many people's practices, uh, including mine, we'll actually do what's also called a, an expansile duroplasty. Uh, this graphic here illustrates the kind of bony decompression, which is essential to treating these kids. Uh, we take off the occiput, uh, the arch of C1. And this graphic, it actually shows that uh, they've taken off a bit of uh, the top, uh, excuse me, the lamina of C2 as well, uh, which you may need to do in, in uh, more uh, radiographic severe cases of a QR malformation. Um, for those of people who uh, aren't familiar with the term, uh, duroplasty refers to when we actually open the dura, uh, the dura matter uh, on, uh, on top of the tonsils, and we'll either actually just leave it wide open uh, or we'll expand it out. Either we put in a, a, an artificial piece of material to make it bigger 
or we'll put in some sort of autograft. Uh, in my practice, I'll harvest a little bit of pericranial tissue from another site and actually plug it in there. And, uh, you know, after, like after a Thanksgiving dinner, uh, the jeans are too tight. Uh, you put some more material in there and make the jeans bigger. Um, it, there's reasons for and against uh, why we do this. And uh, from a surgical perspective, um, if we don't do the duroplasty, it's uh, much simpler. Uh, the surgery is quicker, takes less time, and there's a lower risk of complication. Specifically, we're worried about something uh, like a CSF leak. Uh, from the literature, what we know is that in, patient, in practices where you don't do a duroplasty and you universally do just a bony removal, um, about a quarter of the patients will actually require some sort of further surgery for incomplete symptom resolution. But their complication rate, that is specifically CSF uh, leaks, uh, drops down to almost zero, which is pretty good. Um, in practices where we, people do do an expansile duroplasty, um, the rate of needing further surgery is actually much, much lower, on the order of about 1%. Um, however, the rate of CSF leak is actually much higher. It's about 10 foot, anywhere from 1% to 10%. And when you do have a CSF leak, the biggest concern is, you know, if CSF can get through the wound, the bacteria can get in. And there's about 10% infection rate when you have an active CSF leak, which is unacceptable. And, and to be honest, an indication for us to take these patients back to surgery. So it's, there's an, an increased operative risk when we do a duroplasty, a little bit more time uh, involved as well. But the need, excuse me, the rate of incomplete treatment of uh, symptoms is actually much, much lower. And this is often a discussion with the patients as well as a surgeon, uh, surgeon preference, what they're most comfortable with when discussing with patients which intervention, which surgical intervention best to proceed with. Um, so I'm sorry, go on, Dr. Wilson. No problem. So I'm just uh, showing this post-operative CT scan for uh, the head for this patient. And as you can see here, this was nicely described by Albert, the uh, removal of the lower part of the occipital bone and probably the posterior arch of uh, C1. Uh, we are going to move on to patient four. She is uh, a 12 month old girl. She is X31 weaker. Uh, and she presented with uh, bruising and the, the skeletal survey was normal and they just wanted to scan her for intraventricular or intracranial hemorrhage. And uh, incidentally, again, when we have scanned her, this is her sagittal T1 weighted sequence, the sagittal T2 weighted sequence, we can see that she is, has, is having herniation of her tonsils and the, uh, the spine imaging showed only uh, mild prominence of uh, the central canal. But when we have imaged her lower spine, we discovered the presence of a focus of T1 hyperintensity in her phylum, denoting that she is having fibrofatty infiltration of the phylum. And this uh, first imaging was done in 2016. When we have done the follow-up in 2019, we have seen that uh, we have persistent herniation of her tonsil as evidenced by the sagittal T1 and T2 weighted sequence and her CSF flow study showed again the restriction of uh, the flow. But uh, she started developing a huge syrinx in her uh, uh, thoracic spine, as you can see from the sagittal T2 and from uh, the axial T2 weighted sequence with some thinning of uh, the spinal cord around uh, this uh, syrinx. And we redemonstrate here the fibrofatty infiltration of uh, the phylum. Interestingly, in spite of the fact that this patient is having a syrinx, I think that uh, Albert would uh, discuss her clinical presentation and the management. Thank you. Uh, yeah, this is a, and this is actually not an uncommon situation or uncommon scenario as well. And it's a kind of an intra, a, a fascinating one uh, for, for multiple reasons. Um, you know, this is a clinical scenario that we, that we come across not uncommonly, PR1 malformation, and you got a little bit of fatty phylum as well. And in this case, this patient was actually lost to follow up. And when they represented, they had imaging findings that were significantly progressed. However, clinically, they remained completely asymptomatic. No appreciable neurologic de deficits, developmentally appropriate, and no overt myelopathy. And despite um, significant, what I would define as significant radiographic progression, um, the family has decided, and a combination of family as well as other social factors, has decided that you know no intervention is, is the way they want to go. And they have not, uh, the kid has actually been, remained completely stable. And for that reason, we've actually just elected to, to continue to monitor this patient closely. Um, you know, we would expect that this patient with such a significant radiographic progression would have developed uh, some sort of symptoms by now. 
however, the patient has actually remained totally fine, which I think speaks to the fact that often there's a very significant clinical radiographic disconnect. So uh, I think that this slide here is summing it up all. We have different uh, clinical scenarios here. All of them, as you can see here, is having the classic uh, herniation of the tonsil in uh, the upper cervical spine. But uh, their spine is different and their management was uh, different. So in patient one here, we have a Chiari one malformation. We do not have a syrinx and the patient is clinically stable and uh, did not need surgery. The second patient has herniation of the tonsils. The spine did not show uh, any uh, syrinx. The patient has scoliosis, but the patient had surgery in this second clinical scenario. The third patient, again, there is herniation of the tonsils. There is a big syrinx. The patient went for surgery because the patient was symptomatic. In the fourth patient, in spite of the fact that we are having a uh, the herniation of the tonsils and a large uh, syrinx here, but the patient did not have surgery. So we are having uh, like a sort of clinical radio, uh, radiographic dilemma. Sometimes we do patients who look, uh, uh, do have patients on the MR screening who look uh, very florid like these patients with huge syrinx and uh, they end up to be non-symptomatic and they do not uh, need surgery. And some patients, they only have herniation of the tonsils with oh, no spinal manifestations and they go for surgery. And we are trying to find a better way to predict for these symptomatic Chiari-1 malformation. So where are we now? There is a number of measurements, parameters, and imaging findings which have been examined in multiple studies to determine if they could reliably predict which individuals with Chiari-1 would have symptoms and which would benefit from surgical treatment. Uh, so this prompted us to conduct a prospective study to a retrospective study to answer the following question. Is there any MRI parameter or clinical criteria which can predict the need for intervention in Chiari-1 malformation? So we started this retrospective uh, study collecting patients between January 1st, 2007 until 2020. We were able to have uh, to collect 129 uh, patients and our inclusion criteria included all Chiari-1 patients from 0 to uh, 18 years who have a baseline MRI of the head and the spine. We excluded any patient who does not have a baseline head and spine MRI. And if the quality of the MR was not uh, uh, good, and all the patients who have symptomatic uh, syndromic features, either on imaging or clinical history, we excluded them from uh, the study. Uh, and we uh, used the syrinx as an outcome, and we had 30 patients with syrinx and 99 uh, without syrinx. And when we used the surgery as an outcome, we uh, have uh, 28 patients having surgery and 101 patients without uh, surgery. So our materials and method regarding the radiology, we measured lots of parameters here in order to try to find what is really significant. And we ended up finding that the position of the obix, the presence of a syrinx, the angle of the cerebellar tentatorium, the kinking of the medulla, and the scoliosis were the ones which were really significant. So let's see how these radiographic criteria appear on our MR study. So we'll start with the obix position. This is a normal patient here, and the obix is uh, seen here. It is the outflow of the fourth ventricle. And this line here, we call it the McRae's line, which is a line connecting between the nasian and the opethian. And uh, normally, the obix position should be above this McRae's line. But when we look into the patient with Chiari-1 malformation, we will see that this obix position has herniated below the McRae's line. And when we studied this group of patients, we found that about 56.7% uh, of the patient with syrinx uh, had the obix below the, uh, the McRae's line with a p-value of uh, 0 0.002 and with a sensitivity of 97.6. And when we measured the outcome against surgery, we found that 67.9% of the patients who had surgery had the, their obix below the McRae's line with a p-value less than 0 0.001 and with a sensitivity of 96.4. So this is the first parameter which we have found to be helpful. Then the second parameter which we have found is the kinking of the medulla. 
this uh, uh, MRI uh, again is showing here the herniated tonsil and for sure it is showing the obix to be below the uh, cranial, the macrase line but as well we are seeing kinking of uh, the medulla here as uh, the uh, uh, green arrow is uh, pointing and we have seen that patients with syrinx have uh, about in 33 percent uh, uh, of patients with syrinx they have kinking of uh, the medulla and uh, the specificity was high it was 87.3 and the, uh, uh, the kinking of the medulla was seen in 50% of the patients who underwent surgery with a p-value of less than 0 0.001 and with a specificity of 89.1. The third parameter which we found to be helpful is uh, the cerebellar tentorium angle. This is a uh, cerebellar tentorial angle is an angle which is uh, measuring the slope of uh, the tentorium. And I'm showing you here a normal patient. And as you can see here, this uh, angle which is between uh, the, uh, the line extending from uh, the dorsum of uh, the uh, the, uh, the dorsum celli to the uh, anti uh, interior uh, cerebellar uh, uh, into the uh, occipital protuberance. And th this angle here is 33% uh, in a normal patient. But when we look into this patient in of Kayari 1 without syrinx, we see that there is increased steepness of this angle. It is 45%. And probably this represents what Dr. Tu has described before as uh, the small posterior fossa. So it represent the increased steepness of uh, the tentorium in this group of patients. And as we can see here, the sensitivity of this uh, angle is 95.2 in uh, patient with uh, syrinx and the specificity is 83.1 in the group who had uh, surged. Uh, the fourth radiographic criteria which we have studied is uh, the scoliotic deformity. And we have found that scoliosis was seen in about 30% in patients with a syrinx with a p-value of less than 0 0.001, and the specificity was high, it was 97.6. And the scoliosis was seen in 21.4 patients who underwent surgery with a p-value of uh, 0 0.071 and with a specificity of uh, 93. The last but not least is the syrinx. When we have studied the syrinx against surgery as an outcome, we found that 60.7% of the patients with syrinx underwent surgery with a p-value of less than 0 0.001, which was about 87.1. So these are for the radiographic criteria. Uh, what about the clinical uh, criteria, Albert? Um, thanks, Nagwa. That's wonderful. Um, when we go through the clinical symptoms that these patients had, um, looking as an indication for their intervention, um, we see that pain was probably the most uh, consistent uh, symptom. Uh, occipital headaches occurring in about 30% of patients, uh, or even uh, neck pain uh, seem to be very predictive for, uh, for surgery. Um, specifically, daytime neck pain also was predictive for uh, having a syrinx. And when we look at uh, other types of uh, dysfunction, specifically brainstem dysfunction and cranial neuropathies, um, the things that really popped out were the presence of sleep apnea as well as a swallowing abnormality. Uh, a significant proportion of patients had some degree of motor dysfunction, specifically distal upper extremity motor dysfunction, and this was uh, characterized by uh, dysfunction in fine finger or fine uh, hand type movements, as well as lower extremity dysfunction. And this was either proximal or distal, you know, often uh, seen in kids as a weakness in their proximal movement or asymmetry in their gait. Uh, and this was almost, excuse me, and in significant number of patients, this is often bilateral. Um, Consistently amongst for patients who had both syrinx as well as who had surgery, uh, change in their sensory function throughout their extremities was fairly consistent. Uh, change in cessation in their distal as well as proximal upper and lower extremities uh, was very predictive for both, um, excuse me, for both the development of uh, syrinx as well as for need and surgery. So uh, I would like to go back to this slide one more time to take a closer look after we have studied our uh, groups of patients. So as I mentioned before that all of them, they have Chiari 1 malformation, but uh, uh, there is a difference between the pattern of uh, the cerebellar tonsillar descent in each patient. So let's take a look at this patient who has no syrinx and no surgery and remained stable. 
here if we look at the obix position the obix position is uh, uh, just at or above uh, the macrae's line and uh, the patient doesn't have a syrinx and uh, the patient remains stable throughout uh, the follow-up when we look in this patient too here we realize that this patient is having uh, inferior positioning of the obix below the macrae's line in addition to kinking of uh, the medulla and in spite of the fact that this patient doesn't have any syrinx he was very symptomatic and ended up having surgery when we look into patient three here we can see that the obix position is below the macrae's line there is no kinking of the medulla the patient is having uh, scoliosis in addition to the uh, to the syrinx and this patient was very symptomatic and needed surgery whereas as patient four we are seeing the obix position is just at or above the macrae's line the patient is having a significant syrinx but uh, the patient as well is having fatty infiltration of uh, the phylum so we are not sure why this patient is uh, having the uh, the uh, the Chiari 1 malformation and the syrinx and he doesn't have any symptom maybe there is a relationship with the presence of fibro fatty infiltration of uh, the phylum and the development of the syrinx and the development of uh, this Chiari 1 malformation and this needs further studying so we are still analyzing our results. We would like to create like some sort of a scoring system using these radiologic criteria as well as the clinical criteria to be, bet to be able to better assess this group of patients. And we would like as well to determine the natural history of the different sub uh, subsets which we have seen in patients with Chiari 1 mal malformation. Uh, and before I conclude the, this uh, study, uh, myself and Dr. Tu, we would like to give a special thank you to our research team, to our two pediatric radiology fellows, Maria and Nitika. We would like to thank as well uh, our medical student, Christian and Maria, and uh, our two statisticians, Nick and uh, Vid. Um, you know, I think the hopefully the takeaway points from this talk are that uh, hopefully what we've emphasized is that cure one malformations are often an incidental finding. I think they're common in the population, but more often than not, they actually don't have any symptoms at all. When you do come across a patient who does have a QR1 malformation, identified potentially on some incidental pictures, um, the key things to take away from history, the key questions to ask include whether or not they have a headache, neck pain, sleep apnea, paresthesias, or any change in their strength in their upper and lower extremities. If you have a left convex scoliosis in a male, or a patient with a scoliosis with some sort of neurologic exam abnormality, they definitely require further imaging. Uh, I think from the radiology point of view, the uh, take-up uh, take point is that Chiari 1 traditionally has been defined by measuring the position of the cerebellar tonsils relative to the foramen magnum. But uh, there is more to Chiari 1 than just measuring the tonsils below the craniocervical junction. I think we need to have better assessment for the obix position for the kinking of the medulla because they can be a useful adjunctive descriptor for the Chiari 1 and may be associated with clinical disease severity. As well as it is important to image the whole spine to assess for the presence of the syrinx and to assess for incidentals like that, the one which we have seen with the fatty infiltration of the phylum. It can help in the management of this uh, group of patients, and hopefully, we will be able to better understand this group of patients. And uh, thank you all for your attention. Any questions? So thank you very much uh, to uh, Albert and Nagwa for, uh, for your excellent presentation. There's uh, lots of uh, time for questions. I just wonder, uh, I have a question for Albert with regards to from the data that uh, you've gone through and, and looking to try and uh, determine uh, which patients should be moving on for surgery from both the clinical and uh, uh, radiologic perspective. How do you apply that now in your practice? Oh, that's a, that's a great question, Dr. Duffy. Um, in, terms of the, the, in terms of the radiographic criteria, I, I think it helps us distinguish uh, or identify which patients we think are more likely to have symptoms and maybe focus some of the questions uh, that we might be asking. And in terms of the clinical criteria, you know, I think that the main things that, uh, for me, that I've taken away are that I'm much more focused about the questions that I may ask, uh, you know, specifically around uh, workup or sleep apnea, um, as well as for uh, potential um, uh, other type, uh, you know, kind of these ancillary symptoms that 
maybe a little harder to elucidate in, uh, in younger children. Um, it, the paresthesia is I, I always ask patients whether they have, uh, they have sensory dysfunction, but it can be very hard to tell sometimes. Um, but I do make it a point to, to try to assess for some sort of uh, sensory dysfunction in these kids. Okay, thank you. Uh, other questions, comments? Hi, I can ask a question. This is Claudia. Hi, Hi Albert. Claudia. Hello, everyone. Good morning. And thank you for an excellent yeah. presentation. I, I really enjoy it. Uh, and I'm sorry, I don't have a camera. That's why I have a, I'm in my workstation. So now I would like to ask you that uh, with respect to the, um, the imaging protocol, I think there is a variability of the imaging protocol in terms of, I mean, we're suspecting carry and some in some centers, maybe they do the CSF flow, others no, and maybe variability in the measurement of the tonsils. Um, that's one thing, the, the protocol, the imaging protocol and the variability that you notice maybe in your study. And the second question will be with the, um, with, I, th I thought it was very interesting, like the, the patient that you showed that had more like rounded configuration of the tonsils, not so much the scent, uh, was actually one of the ones that uh, went to surgery. And I think it was patient three. And the others that had more like, a, you know, the pointy, uh, configuration, more elongated, the uh, tonsils were less, in, uh, in a way, less symptomatic. But then I was thinking of the 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 location as well of the descent of the tonsils to predict the 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 syrinx eventually, because of the ovex and the location of the uh, the central canal in the cord. Maybe that has an impact because there is some compression to it, or I don't know. Maybe Albert can explain that more uh, in with respect to the anatomical. Um, setting for that, but but yeah, like if you can comment on this, I don't know if I'm a little um, confounding. I can comment on maybe in the last part. Um, okay. Maybe just to take a step back and look at some of the original literature describing Chiari malformation. I mean, the very very first papers coming out describing this this disease. I mean, um, we're actually they they basically was done retrospectively. Uh, what they did is they just looked at all the patients who had it and they looked at all the patients who had surgery and they arbitrarily decided that if you had tonsillar descent greater than a certain point then and you were more likely to have surgery and they just arbitrarily decided that you know five was five millimeters or at this at c1 was an easy number to pick an easy thing to identify and that became the established criteria and that sort of has stuck around i think for many many years and i think that's where a lot of our literature currently comes from is that if you have a QR1 malformation because it reaches these criteria, then you, you reach diagnostic and you have a QR1 malformation. But I think that what um, our studies and what I think a lot of centers are starting to understand is that it's probably a little more, um, much more subtle than that. It's not just the tonsils being in a lower position. It's not just the herniation of that part of the brain that's causing issues. And it's actually probably a corollary to something else that's happening. Um, uh, uh, an anecdotal example that we see actually in a number of cases is that patients can present having a lot of bad symptoms and the, the tonsils are very, very subtly low or not even low at all. And when we actually take them to surgery because they have, uh, because we're convinced that they do have some degree of obstruction of CSF outflow, what we'll see actually is that they, instead of the tonsils themselves cause an issue at the obstructing CSF, they might actually have some sort of scarring or web which we can't see on the MRI scan, but intraoperatively, very clearly they have some sort of abnormal pathologic tissue that's actually causing the, 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 the flow of fluid out of that part of the brain to be disrupted. And I think that's why some of the thinking is now shifting away from looking at just the tonsil position towards actually looking at what we think is the primary pathology, which is you know, CSF outflow disruption. Um, I think currently, and, and maybe Dr. Nagwa, you can speak to this better than I can, we don't have good measures for that. And all the things that we looked at in this study are basically corollaries to that finding specifically. But I think for us to specifically identify that is very difficult. And I think that explains why there are many cases, the radiographic pictures based on our current measurements don't really match up perfectly with the clinical presentation of these patients. Yeah. 
so Claudia, I think your question was uh, two regarding the protocol for the imaging and uh, the second question, I think Albert uh, uh, answered that, but I'm mm -hmm. going to comment. So I will start by uh, the protocol. I think that the protocol is not consistent when we look at the patients from 2007. There is some of the consequences which is missing, such as uh, the CSF flow. So we did not study the CSF flow. Uh, and uh, there was variability of the imaging of the spine. Some of the, the, the spine imaging was done only for the cervical spine. So mm -hmm. that's why we had a huge number of patients to start with, and we had to exclude the, some of the patients because we did not have a baseline of a full spine MRI, and uh, we have uh, some missing pulse sequences. So uh, I think that the, the best protocol, which is right now done, it is our routine brain where we have the 3 dt one weighted sequence. We can always add a sagittal T2 in addition to the CSF flow study. And we need to image the whole spine because we okay. have seen the incidentals like the fatty infiltration of the phylum. This is a good example because we are seeing the fatty infiltration, which looks big. But when I looked into several other patients, I have found the fatty infiltration to be very minimal uh, and in fact i have just done a case uh, maybe one or two days back and i have acquired thin sections at the level of the phylum terminale and i have seen that there is minimal fibro fatty infiltration and i think it, the patient is having syrinx and minimal uh, cerebellar tonsillar uh, descent so i think that imaging of the spine should be done the whole spine uh, in addition to acquiring the T1 axial to the lower, a proper T1 axial to the lower, in addition to the CSF flow at the craniocervical junction. This is regarding the, the, uh, the protocol. Regarding your question about the craniocervical junction, I think we need maybe to better understand that uh, the craniocervical junction is not traditionally just measuring the tonsils below the craniocervical junction. We need to put, uh, to look at uh, the the appearance of the obics, the position of the obics, the kinking of the medulla, and as well the cerebellar tonsillar, uh, the slope which we have uh, shown. I probably think that this is secondary to an abnormality at the level of uh, the bones because uh, lots of theories have been there regarding the size of the posterior fossa and the slanting or the steep appearance of uh, the tentorium points out to the fact that this posterior fossa is small and that's why there is a herniation of the tonsils and maybe that's why there is a obstruction of the flow. The presence of webs or membranes, I think it is difficult to see on MR unless we add, for example, like a fiesta sequence in the future which can help us better with the presence of a membrane yeah and I agree. that's what i was going to say that maybe this is a good idea to uh, plan for a potential future quality improvement of you know in thinking of the of protocol people. in the department and yes. the other thing is that sometimes i even find more useful to add a fiesta like you said than a csf flow because it's almost expect you know you know what you are going to see in the csf flow when you see the changes at the cranial cervical junction, which I find it maybe is useless. So I think the Fiesta may be more useful in this case. But no, so, yes, yeah, thank you very much for your... Uh, your question work. from uh, Dr. Miller. So I'm, I'm just gonna actually ask neurosurgery. Thank you, Dr. Wilson and Dr. Tu for a nice presentation. But when I came to Chio years ago, I was told that the neurosurgeons need the CSF flow sequence. And that's why I have to put it in, in all mind. But in reality, we know today that the sequence is not that specific and not that good. And, and I actually um, I echo Dr. Martinez, which is saying that this is probably that something that we should not be doing as a routine. So i like to see from the neurosurgery perspective, what is the expectation? Uh, th thank you very much for that comment. Um, you know, the way, I, the way I look at a CSF flow study is that it's an ancillary piece of information that is not 100% diagnostic, but it adds to the amount of information we get. I will say that universally, it is not, it is not gonna be helpful for every single study, um, but there are times when it does help us either predict the surgery or predict the type of surgery we might, uh, we might intervene on. Um, so I wouldn't say that it's totally useless, and I wouldn't say it's totally useful, uh, but in the proper context, it actually does have a role. I, I fully agree with your sentiment that it's not a validated, it's not quantitative. And if we applied it universally, no, we wouldn't find it very useful. But I think that I do like it for very specific sequences, but not all. Uh, other questions or comments? I don't see any hands up. Uh, if you can't raise your hand, feel free to ask a question directly. Uh, 
we have still have some time. So it doesn't appear uh, that there is anybody uh, else. So I will draw it uh, to a close and thank Albert and Nagwa for an excellent presentation. Uh, I think we all learned a lot and uh, good luck with your future work in this area. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank, thank you, you for having us. Thank you.